All right, so we're ready to get started. Uh, welcome to the channel, Don. Uh, this is the first time you're on my channel. I know I've seen you around the internet before, so on various other YouTube channels. Uh, can you go ahead and introduce yourself, tell us a bit about who you are, what you do, all that sort of thing? Sure, my name is Don Loeb. I teach at the University of Vermont. I've been there for over 30 years. Um, I specialize in meta-ethics and um, most of my work defends uh, moral anti-realism. Cool. Okay. So I know we I know we've talked before, uh, but Thank this you. is the first time. Uh, yeah, on my channel, I should say that we're we're already friends. We already know each other. Uh, so I'm hoping we can have just the sort of casual kind of conversation that could be of value to viewers. And this is I, I wanted it to be a lot less structured. Like I don't have a, a set of questions that I want to ask you. Uh, but I do want to start with one of the things that I, I haven't seen you talk quite as much about, uh, but that I, I've started to see you get pretty well known for around uh, online, I guess, uh, which is the gastronomic realism. So I was hoping we could start by you uh, talking a bit about, you have a paper on that and yeah. like what you do in that paper, what basically what point you're trying to make and, and basically how you perceive the purpose of that, like what you're trying to do with that sure. like sort of argument. Glad to do it. The um, in my on my screen, you're frozen. Oh, now you're not anymore. Um, okay. Um, so gastronomic realism, a paper I wrote a long time ago. It started out as kind of a parody of moral realism, gastronomic realism, realism about gastronomic va gastronomic value facts, not whether something is uh, one food is uh, more popular than another or healthier um, than another or less expensive or morally better in some way, but gastronomically better than another um, or worse, et cetera. Um, it seemed like a kind of crazy position offhand, um, an implausible one. And yet I wrote the paper during the heyday of naturalistic moral realism of a sort that got called frequently called Cornell realism. And I thought that some of the arguments that I thought were quite clever arguments that Cornell realists were using to defend their form of moral realism could maybe not quite equally well, but pretty well um, be used to defend a kind of gastronomic realism, which looked absurd to me. And that formed the basis for a kind of reductio of moral realism. But by the time I was done with it, I started thinking that I wasn't really sure I had serious objections to moral realism, sorry, to gastronomic realism. And I feel the same way about certain forms of, about this naturalistic kind of moral realism, that it's just not the kind of, um, it's not a form of realism that I find too offensive from my anti-realist point of view. I don't think it leaves us in any, much of a different position than we're in um, at the way I see the world. So um, in the end, I just claimed, instead of claiming that the this was a good reductio of moral realism, of that variety, what I tried to claim was that that um, they were both roughly equally plausible. But there's a lesson I thought to be learned here, and that's the real point of the paper. And there are a lot of jokes in the paper, and I had a lot of fun with it. And I think it's a fun read. And if you do read it, you should look at the footnotes because that's where an awful lot of the jokes are. But um, the main point was something like this: Look, suppose I find out that there are um, real gastronomic value properties and that some foods are better than others, but I just don't like them. Um, when it comes time to sit down to dinner, um, not only do, would it be non-irrational for me to eat what I like instead of what's good, um, it would be, there, there's a sense in which it would be irrational for me to eat anything but what I'd like, right? I've got a decision to make. Okay, I know this, I know this, um, Sauerkraut is better than coleslaw, but I don't like. I like coleslaw. I don't like sauerkraut, so um, I'm not going to eat it because I've got to make a decision about um, whether I want to eat what's good, what's really good. Now, moral realists sometimes ask anti-realists like me why we take our own values seriously, why we act on them. But I want to kind of turn the question around to them. Suppose that naturalistic moral realism um, of the Cornell variety is true. It's correct. And I find out that certain conduct is immoral and other conduct is morally required. All right. Um, on that view, I don't necessarily have reasons to heed the requirements and prohibitions of and permissions of um, real morality. 
I've got a decision to make about whether I want to be a moral, um, whether I want to adhere to morality. And it's a decision just like the decision that has to be made by the, um, if gastronomic realism were correct, I'd have to make similar decisions. So it looks to me like even the realist, you know, they find these values and they say, these are the real, this is the real moral truth. And now my question is, okay, so why pay any attention to that? And you still got a decision to make. By analogy, think about this. There's, suppose I find the book of um, an archaeologist discovers um, in some long lost library, the book of Nazi morality, official book of Nazi morality. And we can look up what Nazi morality says to do about a particular thing. And it, it's authoritative. It's really a book of Nazi morality, officially endorsed by some Nazi regime. Um, but the fact that Nazi morality tells me to do something doesn't give me a reason to do it at all, right? I still have to decide what kind of person I want to be. Likewise, suppose there is a real morality, at least on the Cornell view, that doesn't necessarily give me reason to obey it. My reasons are dependent upon my purposes. And so uh, if moral realism of that variety is true, it looks to me like moral realists have to make a decision just like I do about what kind of person they want to be, what kind of world they want to contribute to living in, what kind of code they want to live by, et cetera. So that was the point. Cool. Okay. Yeah, I, I found it an especially amusing and fun article. And I, I personally just found it super engaging and a great way of sort of getting these ideas across. I do wonder if some people would have a reaction to that. You're just sort of, um, this is a particular way of deploying a, a, like a human conception of motivation. I don't know if that, if you would characterize it in those terms. Of motivation or of reasons? I, I guess it could be either. I mean, I do have a human picture of reasons, but um, the so do naturalist moral realists. And um, at least insofar as they've talked about reasons for act, they talked about reasons for action. Like Railton, who's, you know, roughly in that category, um, talks about how he's an instrumentalist. And we don't hold morality hostage to the uh, purposes of the worst knave in the world, right? So he takes that sort of explicitly human position. And if that's right, um, they are not in a position to claim that there are these special moral reasons we might associate with Kant more than with Hume. Um, and so I'm not doing anything different than they do in that paper. Now, if you ask me more generally, do I think that um, non-naturalists face the same kind of worry? What I'd say is, um, I'd have to say something more complicated about that, and I haven't written about it. But roughly what I'd say, I'd make the same move about moral reasons. I'd say, okay, now I have moral reasons, but why pay attention to those moral reasons? And that's something I'm going to have to make a decision about as well, right? Unless somebody can show me that it's irrational in some sense that matters to me to ignore morality, telling me that my moral, my immoral behavior or my, or my behavior that uh, violates some canons of true morality is irrational. is just like repeating that it's immoral. I want to know if it's irrational in some sense that's problematic from my point of view. So maybe that's something I could, I should expand upon a little bit, my conception of reasons there. Look, um, there's something special about instrumental reasons. And, um, and here's what it is. I mean, what, here's a simple way to put it. Um, let's take an example. Suppose I want to get to, um, my favorite example is going to Cleveland because I don't know anybody who wants to do that actually, but, um, suppose I want to go to Cleveland and the only way to get there, um, and I want to be there by nine o'clock tonight. And the only way to do that is to get on the number 23 bus. Um, knowing all this, I get on the number 25 bus, which is going in the opposite direction. And somebody says, why are you doing that? And I say, cause I want to get to Cleveland. They would have every reason to suspect that I don't want to go to Cleveland or that I'm um, experiencing some kind of serious mental disturbance, right? That I'm not thinking straight. There's a sense in which that's a crazy thing to do, given my purpose. And everybody who has desires, which is everybody, can understand what's undesirable about getting on that number 25 bus when I need to be on the 23 bus to get what I want. And let, let's assume there's nothing else that I want that's relevant here, like to be where the 25 bus is going. And I want that even more. Let's assume that's not the case. Right. So now you come up, you say, but there are these other reasons and they're more important than your instrumental reasons. And I say, OK, um, why pay any attention to them? And the answer is because that's what reason tells you to do. 
I don't want to know. Um, to me, that just sounds like name calling right now, or um, a sort of eulogistic question question begging um, way of talking, right? So we said we call them reasons, and I say, well, gosh, I really like reasons. I don't want to violate reasons if it makes me act like that person who doesn't do what the only thing that will get him what he really most wants to do under that cert all things considered under the circumstances i don't want to be like that that person's doing something that's anybody who's got desires can see the that there's something undesirable about it right i don't want to be like that i don't want to be irrational is that what you're saying oh no this kind of irrationality is um the kind of irrationality that comes from violating morality I'm like who cares about that kind of irrational um i've got to decide what i care about but i care about getting what I want. I don't know, achieving the world that I, realizing the values that I hold, stuff like that. But what I don't care about is conforming to something, to a set of standards that has the same name as these standards that if I, ignore, the, the ignoring of which would make me act like I'm out of my mind. Right? Yeah. I, the reasons just, they, you can call them reasons, but to me, it's like, it's like, when um, Trump went, when sorry, Ronald Reagan called um, certain nuclear weapons peacemakers, right? <laughs> it's a nice sounding name, right? It makes it seem like who wants to be irrational? But when I'm thinking about not being irrational, I'm thinking about not being like that person who is trying to get to Cleveland and gets on the wrong bus on purpose, right? I'm not thinking about being immoral. And I think calling it irrational, I mean, I know there are all sorts of arguments for why it's really irrational and basic and principles of rationality we ought to accept but it is i don't know calling it irrational seems like um there's a kind of irrationality that's obviously undesirable to anybody who wants stuff and this isn't it and yet it's um to my mind stealing it has the um i'd, I'd like to use the phrase i don't remember who, who coined it that this has all the benefits of theft over honest work i have shown us what's crazy about ignoring these reasons just that it's morally wrong to I'm acting on principles that I can't universal, like blah, 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 maybe. But that doesn't seem to make me, that, I don't find that undesirable in anything like the way I find um, instrumental irrationality um, undesirable. And I think anybody with desires can, including Kant, by the way, right? Who thinks it's, it's a legitimate part of rationality. I just don't get the other part. Yeah, this, these sorts of considerations remind me of this remark that I've, I've quoted a few times, and maybe you've seen this from David Lewis. Uh, I, I pulled it up uh, where where he said, um, why care about objective value or ethical reality? The sanction is that if you do not, your inner states will fail to deserve folk theoretical names, not a threat that will strike terror into the hearts of the wicked. But whoever thought that philosophy could replace the hangman? There you go. And it, it always it, it always struck me as strange, but I have seen a few people who have said something like this, and I wonder how you would respond to this. And I think this is largely coming from a non-naturalist perspective, which is they'll say it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to say, like, why be moral um, or why do whatever the moral facts happen yeah. to be? Because by their very nature or by definition, what they are just are the facts that you ought to comply with. How would you reply to that sort of claim? Yeah, look, um, I remember I used to... When I was in graduate school, I had a professor that I would have an argument, a regular argument with, and every time I won it, he would forget it before the next argument, the next iteration of the argument. He would say, so, I'd say, you know, why follow my Kantian reasons? And the teacher would say, by asking why, you're asking for a reason. So you see, you're already committed to reasoning. And I say, okay, how will it serve my purposes to follow instrumental, to pay attention to Kantian reasons, to adhere to Kantian reason? And he's like, okay. Right. I mean, I don't have to be committed to it, it. It's true that you can come up with this conception and say, if you violate it, you're violating reason. But I want to know what that amounts to, because right now it just said it like right now. It just sounds like a way of saying it's immoral, but we want a little extra punch with that. So we call it ir irrational. I don't know. It's like giving an item a fancy name on a menu to make it more appealing somehow. Yeah. Well, so this, so your motivation for the gastronomic realism was what was popular at, at the time that that sort of that thought coalesced was naturalist realism. Is that correct? Yep. 
Yeah, so this is something I wanted to ask about just because I I am not as familiar with the, I guess you could say the recent history or like the 20th century meta ethics so much. But one of the things I've noticed, and I'm, I'm sure you're you're aware of like the, the recent Phil papers, there's 2009 and the 2020, the survey results on moral realism. Yeah, so in 2009, just for, I guess, the, the audience, um, it was about 56%. Uh, so, sorry, I should just give a little background. Yeah. So the Phil paper survey is the survey that was sent out primarily, I think, to specific universities, predominantly within the Anglophone world. And most of the respondents are analytic philosophers. I'm not going to get into breaking down all the distinction there, but it's mostly analytic philosophers. And I think about half of the respondents, at least in the 2020 survey, were in the United States. And then the rest are going to, like most of the rest are UK, Canada, um, Australia, and then you get this sharp decline in people from other nations that are responding to these questions. So it's giving you this uh, demographically rather specific subset of philosophers largely operating with analytic philosophy. It was a, a little under 2,000 uh, respondents. Anyway, so they surveyed them on a, about a bunch of questions. Back about 10, 10 11 years ago, or I guess pushing uh, 15 years ago, uh, you had about 56%, and then it seems to have bumped up in 2020 to 62% of philosophers endorsing moral realism, and that's about evenly split between naturalism and non-naturalism. And then um, that, uh, and then if you look at just specialists, which I think there was a little over 200 in the 2020 results that specialize in metaethics, that number doesn't change much. It increases a little bit to 65%. And so you have a majority these days of moral realists that are evenly about evenly split between naturalists and non-naturalists. But I've had the impression, especially from reading older papers, uh, including ones from na about naturalism that I think were around the 1980s or so, where they would have these just offhand remarks about how moral anti-realism just seems to be ascendant. Uh, but we don't have survey data from those decades. So I wanted to hear from you, your perspective on, as we moved through the 20th century, what is your sense of how popular naturalist realism, non-naturalist realism, and anti-realist positions were, and how has that changed over the ensuing decades up until present? So I'm glad they're doing surveys. Um, I'm not confident about the survey results here. For one thing, um, if this were just two studies of some phenomenon that we're trying to understand that's occurring right now, we might say we might call the second one failure to replicate the first result. Right. Um, it's not clear that there's a trend line here. It just might be that, you know, different populations enter different. We, we need a lot more work before we could be really. You're the one who should be telling me this, I think, that we, before we could. Be <laughs> no, I was thinking the same thing right now. That, yeah, it's possible. It's, it's just a difference in who the population is. My impression is that. Um, that non-cognitivism, which arose in, largely out of, out of positivism, um, really did a number on uh, moral realism, and that that um, the anti-realist, uh, vaguely anti-realist approach to uh, moral philosophy, um, I think was pretty dominant when I got to grad school, at least. So I will, um, I will tell you a little quick story about that if you want. Um, I was in graduate school. I had um, I'd been for two years. I had already gone to law school, and I wasn't planning on being a professional philosopher. I was planning on being a lawyer. Grad school was just kind of a fun thing to do along the way, from my point of view. Um, but I, when I went off, so I went off to do a clerkship with a Michigan Supreme Court justice. And during that year, I kind of missed philosophy, and I missed teaching, and and it, and ended up deciding that I wanted to go back to grad school by the time it was over. But in the meantime, I decided I wanted to take one more class and I got permission to take one afternoon off a week and take another philosophy class. And I looked at the list of seminars and there was a seminar on moral realism being taught by a guest professor. And I went to my advisor, Alan Gibbard, who, with whom I'd taken a uh, metaethics class or maybe normative ethics class. Um, and I said, uh, I'm looking for something to do with, I want to take one class in ethics. I want it to be the seminar level, but um, the only thing I see is this class in moral realism. Does anybody take that stuff seriously? Okay, that's what I asked him in 1982. 
And his response was, if anybody can make moral realism plausible, it's Nick Sturgeon. Take the class. Okay, so I took Nick Sturgeon's class. And within a few years of that, Nick's, the, the stuff Nick was teaching in that class, namely what got to be called Cornell realism or form of naturalistic moral realism, um, became quite popular. And I think the scales just tipped the other way to the point where moral realism um, began uh, to become quite ascendant. My impression is when I talk about with people about metaethics is that an awful lot of them are moral realists, way more than uh, people in metaethics anyway. I think moral realism is much more common, commonly distributed than moral anti-realism. Outside of metaethics, I would have thought it was the other way, that more people were, that more philosophers are anti-realist, although I don't have strong intuitions about that. But anyway, um, Cornell realism kind of, um, some of the people who were working on it most prominently um, moved along in their careers or died. Um, and for one reason or another, some having to do with a, a line of thinking that uh, having to do with what was called moral twin earth, um, reasons which I don't think were actually so dispositive against this form of moral realism. It just kind of fell off the map. And at the same time, uh, non-naturalists started to defend these very extreme forms of moral realism in something like the same way the naturalists had. What the naturalists did was they found various tools, I think, reasoning tools, um, analogies, and so on, in other areas of philosophy that could be applied to um, resolving some of the puzzling, most puzzling natures of, na some of the most puzzling features of naturalistic moral realism. So for example, some moral disagreement could be explained away as the product of um, there being indeterminacy. And there was new work on indeterminacy, right? When naturalism of that sort was coming around. Um, new work in philosophy of language and philosophy of mind also was relevant. So um, we could say that we're co-referring even if we don't have the same beliefs about what we're referring to, if we used a causal theory of reference rather than a, uh, um, a theory meaning of some sort that makes puts meaning in the head. Anyway, um, the non-naturalists start to do the same thing, make these partners in guilt arguments saying that, you know, there's nothing weirder about their form of moral realism than um, all, all sorts of stuff we already believed in. And as naturalistic moral realism sort of uh, stopped being so prominent, these very, very extreme forms of moral realism um, came on the scene and began to dominate. Meanwhile, non-cognitivists were becoming more like realists, right? Um, uh, expressivism is hard to distinguish from some forms of moral realism, for example. Um, so I used to think that, you know, for a while I thought there was a way in which metaethics was making progress because the most prominent anti-realists who at the time were the um, non-cognitivists who turned into expressivists their picture of morality looked a lot like the naturalist picture of morality in the end. They were kind of hard to distinguish. But then these very extreme forms of, um, then the error theory came back um, with a bang with um, Richard Joyce's book and some other work. Um, and uh, the non-naturalism became ascendant in uh, as a form of moral realism. I do not think of as a step in the right direction. Do you, can you roughly place the, the sort of timeline? Like when was naturalism, when did that sort of crest and then decline and then the same for non-naturalism? Well, one of the most prominent non-naturalist moral realists around today is my colleague, Terence Cunio, right? But 20 years ago, um, he was also, he was my colleague already and, or 15 years ago, I don't know. And he wouldn't have said he was a non-naturalist. Um, he wasn't really sure about that. So I'd say over the last 15, 20 years, it's been growing in popularity and been defended by people like Russ Schaefer Landau and um, David Enoch and Terence Cuneo and others. Um, as far as naturalism, uh, I spent the first 10 or 15 years of my career spent, you know, focusing a lot on Cornell realism. 
and there's just less to say about it, less being said about it nowadays, as far as I'm aware anyway, that, um, so it's, I don't know, 15 or 20 years, it's been, um, kind of more off, less on the radar than it used to be. Do you but, have, yeah, do you have a sense, uh, because this is something that I've wondered about as I've seen these sort of, uh, rises and falls of the popularity of different positions, at least just within meta ethics. I don't know much about it outside of, of meta ethics. One might look back retrospectively on the history of philosophy as if in fits and starts, there's still being some sort of convergence or progress or some tendency towards the field to move with respect to a particular trajectory that you and I might wa want to or hope or regard perhaps as some degree of justification by whatever standards as like a step in the right direction. But I see these as in a certain sense steps backwards, uh, you know, uh, both naturalism and non-naturalism about morality. So that would be one thing. There would be my evaluative attitude towards the whole thing. But also just more generally, um, I do wonder how much the current trends are a matter of fashion or popularity or inscrutable sociological forces that are not closely correlated with the field moving in any particular direction as a result of substantive developments in good arguments. Like just, just yep. to, to set this up a bit, um, the arguments that I've seen from non-naturalists do not strike me as very compelling. They don't, they seem rather weak to me. And yet they're, it's become more popular. Now, I don't know if the Phil Papers survey results are tracking a substantive trend among professional philosophers, but it, it looks like at least have the impression that realist positions are more popular now, but I, I'm not really sure why they're more popular. Now their proponents might say, well, we've got good arguments or good proponents of these arguments, but I wonder if something else is at work here. And I wonder if you have general thoughts on philosophical change in the attitudes and beliefs and like what those causes might be. In my career, I've seen the pendulum moving back and forth. Um, and I guess I think um, there's a healthy dose of that um, mysterious sociological phenomenon that's present here. Um, but also new tools are available, right? So people do work in one area of philosophy in epistemology that looks like it might shed some light on, um, so for example, people start thinking of epistemology as fundamentally evaluative. And if they do, that suggests certain analogies to, um, morality. And so there are opportunities to exploit these and, um, that come along, right? When I, when I said earlier that the Cornell realists used all sorts of um, tools acquired from other areas of philosophy, right? They're just things that uh, ways of solving problems that we that have been found in other areas of philosophy that could be used to um, resolve some problems for naturalism. Um, it's those tools had become available, and that's what made it possible for those arguments to be made. So I think it's probably a combination of those kind of, of those two factors. I can say this that um, when I go talk when I go give talks, often I get questions about like how can you be a moral anti-realist rather than about whatever it is I'm talking about. Like I feel like I'm like in a zoo and people are just sort of think there's something you know you wow you really are an anti-realist about morality. Can we ask you some questions about that? That's pretty frequent occurrence for me you know more than what i'm talking about because I, I sort of uh, makes me kind of a standout but i also when i hear from young philosophers um i very frequently hear you know once a month once every two months i don't know hear from young philosophers who were you know i've heard of my work because i'm not i'm one of the few people defending anti-realism out there and um they've somehow run across my work and that makes me think that the pendulum's shifting back a little bit I don't know when after Mackey, I'm not sure I could have named a lot of error theorists, you know, for a long time, but, um, now there are quite, I'm working on the now what problem now, which is a thought of as a problem for the error theory. And it's, um, tons of people have contributed to that. And presumably many of them are actually error theorists. So, um, it's possible there are more, there were more of them out there than I thought, but it's also possible that there, um, that the population is growing a little bit. Yeah, and then there's this, you know, see. Yeah. yeah I mean, expressivism, uh, something I wouldn't mind saying something about is, look, 
think of non-cognitivism as just as simply the view about moral language that moral sentences don't even express propositions. They don't make factual assertions any more than questions do or commands do. They do something else. They express emotions or something. A very simple view would be an A or style view where they're, where they're being used to say, to say something like yay or boo, or to tell people what to do. That's also, um, that also features an Ayer's sketch of, of his view. He's a, not just a emotivist, but he's a kind of um, a prescriptivist as well. But anyway, um, that view developed into this view also with some new tools of philosophy at its disposal, according to which anti-realists um, who start off non-cognitivists can bit by bit, as Blackburn says, earn uh, the right to talk about morality, to talk moral talk, because they can show how the whole framework can be um, understood from within an anti-realist perspective. And then they say that's that's actually what's the best understanding of what's going on. It's not what people think it, they're doing when they think about morality or talk about morality, but it's the best explanatory theory about what's going on. Okay. Um, my view is that expressivism was a kind of step backwards. So it, that, that, that what happened was moral realists were very concerned to reproduce the trappings of moral realism as best they could, including things like moral truth, right? And so it used to be we had these, I don't know. Um, my worry about is that we've, we've lost, suppose the population, think about it like this. Um, People may not have very fully, or non-philosophers may not have very fully articulated um, meta-ethical views. But to the extent that you have meta-ethical leanings, presumably you're going to talk the way you think the uh, court fits the world, the actual world, right? So, um, So I'm going to think for a second. Um, suppose there are some people out there who are more, you know, if you had to put them in one camp or another, they're not philosophers, they haven't thought a lot about it, but they'd be, you'd put them in the anti-realist camp. You'd expect them not to be making factual assertions about a realm they don't think is a realm of fact. Suppose there are people out there who are you'd basically put in the realist camp. Their language is probably being used to make factual assertions, right? Insofar as it's with it, you know, it's up, up to them to decide what the language is for, right? They probably at least intend their language to be making factual assertions. And presumably there are people of both sorts out there. And it used to be, it looked at one point like non-cognitivism was a nice theory to accommodate what was going on with respect to the part of population that's basically in that kind of anti-realist camp. Um, in some inchoate way, and that realism, or sorry, cognitivism, where the, the view is people making moral, off, uh, uttering moral sentences are making factual assertions, and when they're thinking the moral thoughts, they're having moral beliefs, right? That suggests that that's, that's a nice theory to fit the people who um, roughly are in the camp of thinking morality is a realm of fact. But now we've got both both these theories of moral language try to accommodate morality as a realm of fact. And, I, and, and we don't have a theory or, um, that's very good for what ordinary people are doing insofar as they're not committed to realism. It's like everybody's got this view that ordinary people are basically objectivists about morality in some sense, think the morality is a realm of fact, right? Or inchoately or close to thinking that or presuppose it or something like that. And so both theories are trying to reproduce that, trying to explain how that could be the case, given the way we talk about morality, both expressivism and more and cognitivism. But we've lost the we've lost this theory that seemed to do a kind of nice job of tracking what's going on when people who aren't um, presupposing that there's a real morality are talking moral talk, and that seems to me to be kind of a loss, a retreat. It's like you're trying to imitate the moral realists, and I'm not really sure. I, well, put it this way, I'm not confident that that those features are built into moral experience enough that any good theory is going to have to um, 
accommodate them, even if it means not accommodating the uh, metaethical views of a large part of the population or something, like, metaethical presuppositions of a large part of the population. And that makes sense. It does. Yeah. So that's that's actually a good uh, segue into what I wanted to ask about next. But I wanted to, to ask, could we get like a quick one minute break and then I'll be back and I want to talk about the empirical stuff. Sure. You, you turn it off. Is that what happens? Uh, no, I could just uh, like mute myself and turn off my camera and run out of the room. I could actually leave you with a question if you want to address it and then I'll just be right back. Sure. Cool. So one of my I, I guess I'll just set this question up because I'm really curious what you think about this. Um, so. One of the things that's happened when I've asked people, and I've asked quite a few people about this sort of question, is when I look at these, the sort of standard set of, of meta-ethical positions that are on offer on your sort of conventional uh, flow chart or like menu of positions, you have the naturalist and non-naturalist uh, realist accounts. And then you have, if you're going off of like uh, humorous ethical intuitionism, he'll give you sort of three anti-realist positions. Now, he makes this very strong claim, and I'm curious what you make of that, too, uh, uh, which is that there are really only three, roughly three categories of positions available, which is error theory, non-cognitivism, relativism. Um, and what, I've, what I have been curious about about this is for that- For anti you mean? Yeah, for anti-realism. I always say realist instead of anti-realist. Uh, so you got the two realist options, naturalism, non-naturalism, the three anti-realist options, relativism, non-cognitivism error theory. Now, I don't accept that those are the only positions available, but what all of them seem to me to have in common is that they feature a semantic thesis, a thesis about the meaning of moral claims. And what interests me about that question, the meaning of moral claims, is whether or not that thesis is intended to be an empirical claim or not. And when I've asked people, like including philosophers, I get a mixed response to that. Some of them seem to say, yeah, this is an empirical question. And then some seem to say, no, this is not an empirical question. And I'm intensely puzzled by that. You know, this is just me asking the question. So I don't know if that's representative or whether there's a consensus I don't know about. But I'm, I'm, I guess I'll just ask what your take uh, on, on this, like what these semantic theses are trying to ask and whether or not what they're asking is an empirical question, or if not, what the appropriate methods for addressing that question would be. Okay. So, um, there may be a reason that people are inclined to think of it as not an empirical question because it's a pretty difficult empirical question. It's not a straightforward empirical question that we can just go ask people what are you doing with your moral words? But I don't see how it can have, um, it can fail to have an empirical component for the reason that um, what we're talking about is dependent upon not my purposes or your purposes, but our collective purposes. Our semantic intentions in some sense determine what it is we're doing with our words. I don't see any way, uh, no matter what you, your theory of language, you're gonna accept something like that, I believe. And that being the case, uh, it's an empirical question what our semantic intentions are. It's a really difficult one, possibly, you know, close to intractable. But something like that has to be what's at issue here. Now, our intentions may not be obvious to us. And trying to produce studies about, hey, um, I want you to go back and I want you to roll the tape back and hear what I just said and answered your question because it's all clear now. And um, you missed it. <laughs> I, I know I heard all of it. Oh, good. Okay. So uh, I don't remember where I was, but um, the point is just, I don't see how we can avoid it being an empirical question, but it's a really difficult empirical question and it's hard to study. I do think there's something right about trying to figure out what people are doing with their words. Um, along the lines I was just talking about a few moments ago, um, I try to figure out whether they are committed to morality as a realm of fact or not, right? So if you can find people's underlying meta ethical presuppositions or commitments, Presumably their talk is going to follow, right? Um, if there are any such underlying commitments. And um, so you want to find out whether people are making factual assertions when they talk moral talk. See whether they think morale is a realm of fact, right? That seems like the right quest, kind of question to ask. Um, but our, it does seem to me that it's um, up to us collectively what our words mean or what we're using, whether we're using them to refer to something, what we're using, you know, what we're doing with them. It, now, if we went out and we asked meta-ethicists whether they take 
he has semantic theses in his claims, like cognitivism, like are, are, do do moral claim, are moral claims propositional or not? Um, I, I'm asking you to speculate a bit here, but do you think? And you just said, is that an empirical question? What do you think the reaction would tend to be like if we if we got them all together and we had everybody discuss this? What would they say? Well, there are. Um, you're gone again. There are. Um, I'm here. You're, you disappeared, however. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Um, I don't know if we'd get a consensus, first of all. So there are people who, like Frank Jackson who say that, um, you know, why don't I recommend that we do empirical studies to, as if it's some kind of big objection against my view to find out whether people are committed to moral objectivity or not. And um, he said, I'm fine with that if it were necessary, but we already know what people are doing um, with their moral talks, so we don't need to do the studies. So... He thinks he knows. He thinks he knows empirically. Um, some of what he thinks he knows empirically, he thinks he knows empirically based on. Um, well, I mean, some of what he knows, he thinks he knows, he knows, he thinks he knows based on introspection. But he's trying. He's projecting his introspection out onto others. But he also says he's listened to what his students think, and so he thinks it's an empirical question, right? But it, um, he just doesn't want to do the hard. He just thinks he can short cut the question more than I think he actually can. Others might say, um, look, we, we philosophers have all sorts of ways of testing um, what people what people are doing with their words, their conceptual commitments. We can ask about various sentences, whether the sentences make sense or not. We can ask, you know, um, so there are people like, like David Enoch's paper about um, why you're committed to moral realism, whether you know, I can't remember what it's called, but why you're committed to moral realism, whether you know it or not, you know, and my guess is that the, my problem with these, all this stuff is just that I would I would not be surprised if you find elements of such commitments in many people's psychologies, but that doesn't mean that we find um, that that's the only thing we'd find, right? There may be um, we may have more than one, uh, our psychologists may be taking us in more than one direction. We have more may have more than one kind of epistemic purpose. Our purposes may be confused may vary from person to person, moment to moment, within a person, you know, stuff like that. Yeah, so, yeah, I mean, if there is an element of empirical, like, if this is at least partially an empirical question, one of the things I wonder about is why it took so long for anyone to bother to start doing studies. There were some, there was an isolated study here or there before the 2000s, uh, before, you know, the turn of the century, but since then, uh, you know, there's a paper in 2003, Nicholson Folds Bennett. Uh, then you have a paper from 2008, Goodwin and Darley. And that's the paper that really got the ball rolling. And it's yeah. only been about 15 years when people really started putting, uh, you know, really started dedicating themselves to this. Now, this is where, you know, my area of specialization is. And if you track the amount of papers per year, you'll see this increase from 2008, where now we're getting a few of these papers a year. It's still not a large literature, but... You know, a few things to note about that is that the entire 20th century, there was virtually no effort to do any actual systematic empirical research on what non-philosophers think about these questions. Uh, you know, a lot of this seemed like armchair speculation about what people take people to mean that I, I just find it baffling. Why would they not think that this is, if this is an empirical question, why wouldn't you sit down and do the research? That seems weird. Uh, but then the other thing that's strange to me is kind of a, can i just comment on that first i mean of course yeah, sure. off from the perspective of having lived through all these years of um the ascendancy of, of x5 but um philosophers thought it wasn't our job we weren't good at that and we could figure it out in our heads anyway um right and so they weren't doing much empirical stuff about much of anything as it turned out um there are some exceptions to that um richard brandt went and lived um, on a Hopi reservation mm -hmm. um, somewhere and wrote a book on Hopi ethics, which was meant to be an empirical study. Though he was not a social scientist, um, he did his best to try to understand that stuff. And certainly philosophers would look at the work of social scientists, but you never you didn't have philosophers working on moral disagreement other than perhaps that case that I'm aware of, right? It just wasn't something philosophers did. So the, the whole idea that philosophers need help with the empirical... I mean, it is a puzzle to me how philosophy lasted as long as it did without somebody saying, um, we need help with the, we, we keep making empirical assumptions that we are not in, in any position to 
um, rely upon. Um, we should get some social scientists in here. I actually feel the same way about the social scientists doing the, the work on moral objectivity. When, I, when Darley's paper came out, I talked to him about it, um, Darlene Goodwin, and like within two minutes, I pointed to three philosophical worries I had about um, the way the questions were put and stuff like that. And um, his response was, oh, no. And my thought was, well, you should have known better than to try to do this without, you know, teaming up with a philosopher as much as I would have known better than to try to do it without teaming up with a psychologist. Um, for example, you know, they asked people whether questions were questions of fact or questions of opinion. And to me, that's asking for trouble because I have opinions about all sorts of matters of fact. So questions of fact aren't really contract, don't really contrast with questions of opinion. How are people to interpret that? How would somebody like me interpret that? Question. It's worse than that. The instructions actually said, what's your opinion about whether these are facts or opinions? So is the instructions themselves use the opinion the presumably way. in a factive way. Using it in the other way to even ask the question. Yeah. Um, but that's, I think, why, one reason why philosophers are reluctant to say that these are empirical questions, because they, I suspect that people think of empirical questions as ones that you could just go out and, you know, look around and find out, as opposed to, you know, designing really complicated and subtle studies that are philosophically sophisticated because they have to be in order to avoid um, various kinds of um, confounds. And even, even then, it's not clear. I mean, I don't know how to do it. Yeah, I mean, that just that is just absurd. Uh, it reminds me, and I think you've used this example before. I use it in my classes, like the spotlight effect, yeah. like, you know, searching where it's easy to search. So the story is a person is like looking for their wallet under a street light in the middle of the night. And then someone comes up and they're like, hey, what are you doing? They're like, oh, I'm looking for my wallet. And they're like, well, where did you drop it? I'm like, I don't know, somewhere around here. Well, did you drop it under the streetlight? No. Well, are you looking there? Well, because it's easy to look here. The light's you know? better. And so, Why are you so, looking? I lost it up the street, but the light's better here. Exactly. So there's something strange about this. That, well, it's hard, so it's not an empirical question. It's still an empirical question. I mean, the immediate example that, to, that came to mind for me is whether a person is lying or not is an empirical question. How yep. easy is it to tell if someone's lying? Uh, <laughs> We haven't figured it out with any degree of decisiveness yet. It's going to, I mean, maybe we get some really sophisticated brain scans and we throw you in an, uh, in an, into it like an fMRI and we could find out if you're lying about some stuff with some degree of reliability. Who knows? Maybe we need nanotech and we need in brain. It doesn't, the point is, it's not an easy question to answer. It's still an empirical question. Uh, so I don't take this question, what do people mean when they make moral claims to be an easy question to answer, but Yep. I still don't think it's a question we can answer from the armchair. But, you know, this is something where I could bring in my own background and knowledge on this. And, you know, perhaps you would have some comments on this. Are you, are, how familiar are you with the whole weird psychology thing that's emerged in the past 15 years or so? Um, if you, what you mean by weird is um, like culturally limited? Yes. That, that use of weird? Yeah. Cultural yeah. Form. So there's there's a paper on this. It's called the I mean, Weird People. I, mean, I mean, it. it when, when I talked about what Jackson did, it's got that element, right? Um, because of the population he's consulting, but it's worse than that because he's trying to read their minds based on their behavior. They do things like reason about moral questions or get excited about moral questions. He takes this as evidence they're realists, but I do those things and I'm not a moral realist. So he's not, so there are even, there are other problems there as well. But yeah, I want to address that too. Is, he's only asking, you know, upper class, for the most part, upper class, you know, white Western, educated, wealthy, you know, people from a right. very narrow range of cultures. So this, this acronym, just, I, you know, this is, you, you're familiar with the acronym, but the, I don't know if my audiences or not, I bring it up all the time. It's an acronym that stands for Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic, spells out weird. It's, it's a cute name that they came up with. Um, this was, I don't know if it's coined, but it's most popularly emerged in a paper that's cited like thousands of times now called The Weirdest People in the World by Henrik Hein and Norn Zion. And what they do in that paper is they, they have several points that they make. One point is that the vast majority of research is conducted on and by people from distinct populations in the world. And this doesn't mean that literally every single individual exhibits all of the characteristics picked out by the weird acronym. It's just that they come from nations that tend to exhibit those traits on average to a greater extent on average compared to other countries. And this means that these these all have um, this sort of cluster of traits leads to cultural differences between different populations, and that shapes the way that people think. And what they do is they point out 
that because most of the respondents in these studies and most of the people conducting these studies are from these populations, that we have a, and this, these populations make up about 12% of the world's population. Uh, we have a very narrow window into what humanity thinks like, because we're only studying a very narrow group of people. They also point out that the majority of these studies are done on college students in particular. Often specifically, it's intro to psych freshmen major, and often it's like psych majors or people in psych courses. So it's even more narrow. It's like specifically 18 year olds in, in like elite universities in the United States. That's like a huge well, that's number of That's gonna appeal to a different population, a, a limited population as well, right? For example, not everybody's out there looking for um, five cents of an answer surveys to fill out, right? Most right, exactly. So yeah, Amazon's Mechanical Turk is this online platform where you can get paid to fill out surveys. The people on there are demographically different in many respects from both the populations from the nations they come from and from the rest of the world. So for instance, uh, some recent surveys on Amazon Turk workers in the United States find like a 30, 40% rate of atheism and agnosticism in the US. That's not representative of the people in the US. It's way higher. It's like 10% or less, I think, in the US. So, I mean, we're, there are quite a big differences. And in that case, people's religious beliefs plausibly matter for their metaethical views. So that's not a case where it's irrelevant. So uh, what they what they find in this paper, and they report on a whole bunch of studies done cross-culturally, uh, that with respect to both moral judgments and other things, even visual perception, there are, it's not just the case that people from weird populations are just sort of somewhere in the distribution. They reliably, if you look at like a chart from the most extreme to the least extreme on any given measure, it's the people from the United States or from weird populations that are either on one extreme end or the other extreme end. So they're not just not representative, they are the least representative population that you could find. They are outliers with respect to the world's population. Now, my point in bringing this up is like Jackson and other philosophers that are appealing to their linguistic intuitions, they themselves are not just typically from weird populations, they're trained and inducted into particular cultures within those populations that, and then they read and are steeped and saturated in the philosophical traditions of Western society from people from those traditions. They're overrepresentative of people from the UK and the United States and, and Western Europe. And so in a certain sense, they are even among populations that are already psychological outliers, they are themselves psychological outliers. So they're, I like to say that they're outliers among outliers among outliers. And then they are sitting in an armchair introspecting and then extrapolating to how everybody in the world thinks outside of there. The problem is the weird research shows that we do a bad job, even if we gather survey data from thousands of people in the US to generalize it to the rest of the world, that they think that they could generalize with a sample size of one themselves and like the people they happen to have talked to, it's totally unsystematic um, to everybody in the world. And that's an even less representative sample. There's something and like more, manifestly more, absurd about this. And and, and um, they interpret the results in ways that line up with a theory that they came in the door with, right? That's what Jackson's doing. He's saying that my students are are realists. I can tell by the way they behave, even though they don't think they are, right? Think the morale is a realm of fact. But even if we could, even we, we cannot even figure out at this point um, in time what the meta-ethical presuppositions and commitments are of the weird population, even the English speaking right. weird population, even if we got past that, I mean, that would be an accomplishment, right? If we could say that in the weird world, um, when people talk about morality, they're talking about a realm of fact, you know, that'd be really interesting. Or it's a, they're talking about a variety of different things that are not compatible, can't be squared with one another. That'd be really interesting, right? But we're not even that, we don't, we can't even do that well. Yeah, but, you know, they're generalizing from what? Talking with their colleagues and college students? So we already have the, like, Bibi and Sacris and the Pulitzer and Wright data, which shows that most of the people in college or college age give, they tend to give more anti-realist responses. Now, we could question the validity of those studies, but this is already something philosophers talk about, where they talk about this, like, you know, you're probably much more familiar with this than me, like the student relativism. Maybe you could comment on that. Um, when I teach intro to philosophy, and I've done this every semester since I began teaching intro to philosophy in 1980, I think, uh, maybe 1981. Um, when we talk about metaethics, I draw a very rudimentary distinction between realms of fact, questions of fact, and questions that are not questions of fact. So I might draw a contrast between, for example, whether there's more than one inhabited planet. There's a right answer to that question, even though we don't know the right answer. There's a fact of the matter, but 
what's the best flavor of ice cream, not what's the most popular. Nobody thinks there's a fact about that matter. Is chocolate better than vanilla? Nobody thinks there's a fact about that. So questions about fashion, not about what's in fashion this year, but about what should be in fashion. Um, don't seem to be questions that have right answers, questions about um, number of people in the room, for example, or even scientific questions are questions that typically have answers. So then I ask them, what's morality? Are the moral questions question of fact or not? I used to give an example, you know, leading question, like I'd ask them, I'd say moral questions like question about abortion, but that just biases things in favor of getting into, you know, relativist or anti-realist answers, because many of them think that abortion is morally permissible and they confuse that with being an anti-realist. So I don't do that much. I don't do that anymore at all. I, ne I didn't, never did it much, but um, I've been teaching for about 40 years. And I would say that, and I've taught, I've been a couple of years off, three or four years off over that time period um, for sabbaticals or whatever. And during that period, so, but I've met, I've had intro virtually every semester that I was teaching, one or two sections. And on average, I would say my results are roughly 90% anti-realists or relativists of some kind. 10% um, some kind of, you know, at least at first glance. Once I, you know, the next thing I do is I threaten to flunk the people who think morality is not real and tell them that they, they can talk me out of it, but they better not um, tell me that it's, what I'm doing is wrong because they don't believe in right and wrong. Um, some of them try to convert to moral realism or they say they didn't understand the question. But their knee-jerk reaction is either a kind of anti-realism or kind of relativism, which they are not carefully distinguishing at that point. Yeah, what do you think? What do you think? At a northern liberal, you know, university. Um, some people might, might have designated a party school once. You know, it's a real university, but it's northern liberal. And I probably would get different results if I were teaching at SMU or at um, Liberty, um, no doubt. But the college students I see... I can, I mean, if, if there were a gambling market on this, um, I could be many, I could be, I could do quite well, I think by just betting on them being not some kind of non-realists or, or relativists. I don't know whether to think of real relativism as a form of realism or not. That's why I'm, um, I keep saying anti-realists or relativists. Sure. I think a lot of realists would want to keep them out of the club though, especially like the contemporary non-naturalists. I think they're. I think they're just sort of. They're. They're kind of half and half, right? They've kind of foot in each camp in a way because I see the motivation for keeping them out of it, but they do believe in moral facts, and part of that makes me think that the the, the more important really distinction really is between people who believe in moral facts and people who don't. So I kind of think I have more in common with um, an old-fashioned non-cognitivist than I do with somebody like Gibbard, who's got who's a, on some views an anti-realist, but thinks there are moral facts. Um, so I would distinguish between factualism and non-factualism um, and say that relativists are kind of factualists, even if they're not, um, you know, it's controversial whether they're realists or not. But, you know, these, these uh, there are other reasons for doing that, right? So um, I think Kantians are factualists in a way, right? They think they're facts about what we ought to do. Um, but they're not real, you know, they'd argue that they're not realists. Okay, but they're, they're on the other team for me. I We should have a whole conversation about the categories here at some point, because that's something that, you know, I, I, I think we got to wrap up here pretty soon. So I wanted to ask a couple more questions, if that's okay. Right. And uh, we'll have to talk about that another time, because those categorization questions to me are really interesting. Yep. And I wanted to get your take on humorous approach to saying there's like these only there's all these only five there's only five metaethical positions because my understanding is that that doesn't your position falls outside of that and so does mine but that's a whole discussion i want to have what i wanted to ask is related to what we're talking about now which is um you had when i read that line in humor uh, um my first response was something like i'm shock and anger because the a position i've defended in print but not um i i, I'm, I can't say it's my position because i think it's still got to be um supported with empirical slash philosophical research of the sort we were talking about before. Um, but it's a position I think I take very seriously and it's not, it doesn't make the list. It, 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 it's, it's not a possible view according to him. So when you're told that the view you've been defending for years is not logically possible, that's a little bit awkward. Um, and it's the same for me. My view does not fall into that, that camp. And so my view apparently isn't 
and it, because humor doesn't just say these are the standard positions he says these are the only possible positions if i recall correctly yeah he I does think so he does and i don't endorse any of them so how is my position he, not possible? he says realism anti it's realism error theory and non-cognitivism basically are the three possibilities yeah, well, that's that's a whole discussion, but I wanted to ask about the the point that you made, and this is something that's tied into the student relativism. I suspect a lot of realists would say, look, the students might say they're relativists, yeah. or they might say they're anti-realists, but they're not really. And you could push them, and then they'll they'll sort of wilt under that that dialectical pressure into quickly uh, sort of flipping into realists. Now, that's that is itself an empirical claim. I don't know why they're so confident about that, um, but. Uh, what was the question I wanted to ask about well, that? I had the question. question thing. I've got views on that. So I can okay. answer whether you ask it or not. I think, you tell me if I'm going the wrong direction. But um, my own view is that um, when you start pushing them like that, you bias your um, results. And so, of course, you can you can push people into thinking that they're utilitarians or that they're not util they're anti-utilitarians. You can push people into thinking that they're moral realists or um, anti-realists. Um, but once the researcher starts doing that, I think they um, cannot claim to be objectively trying to determine what people are actually thinking right about that. It's true that people don't always know what they're doing, um, right? So pe pe and pe people might think that there are moral facts, but not think that they think that there are moral facts. That's a real possibility. But the way to find out whether that's the right possibility or not, if there is one, is not to take somebody who says, I don't believe in moral facts, and keep pushing them until they give up and say, okay, I guess they're moral facts. Yeah, and there doesn't seem to be an appreciation on the part of the people asking these questions that they're an instructor in a position of authority that's overseeing the student's grade. Yeah. And when they're asking the question, it's a leading question. So if a student says, yeah, I don't believe in moral relativism, there's there's all of those components of that, that sort of authoritative dynamic where there's a strong social pressure. This also might be happening in a conversational context in front of an audience. And then to to add on top of that, they'll often ask questions where they reach for top shelf, really rhetorically awful types of things. Like they'll say, oh, so you're saying that Nazis killing everybody isn't morally wrong. It's not objectively wrong. And now what if, what's the person gonna say? No, they look like they're they're like a, some sort of awful monster if they don't agree immediately. Or worse, um, impute them having said um, that it's okay. Right. Because some people think that anything that's not wrong is OK. And that's not the way I would do it at all. I would say it's neither OK nor not OK. Right. Neither more permissible nor impermissible because I'm an anti-realist about moral value, including the value of permissibility. Yeah. What I find strange about this is that if, if I'm an error theorist and I don't think that baby torture is a morally right or wrong, that does not mean that uh, that doesn't tell you anything about my attitude towards it. I could say, OK, I don't think it's morally right or wrong because I don't believe in whatever weird metaphysics are associated with that. But I find it repugnant and awful. And I am just as motivated as a realist to try to stop anybody trying to torture babies. I'm right. going to pass laws against it. Right. I'm going to fight anybody that stop. Yeah. But that's, that's that. That's that right. seems to. So just like rhetorically, this seems to give the impression that you don't think that that you're some kind of right. evil psychopath if you don't immediately see the moral realism. And that just strikes me as really weird. And that reminds me of the question I wanted to ask, which is, this is what's one of the things realists will say is the, the way the students act reveals that they're actually realists. So can you comment on that? Okay, so first, just ask me that question in a second, because I wanted to say one thing about what you just said. Look, this is what is, this is, for many years, I found Sturgeon's paper, Moral Explanations, to be really troubling. Because at the end of the paper, it looks like the moral real anti-realist is left with a choice between either claiming that certain moral explanations like moral explanations of Hitler's behavior can be rejected only if we reject all causal explanations and become utter skeptics, right? That our choices are to either be a complete skeptic or be both a moral realist and a realist about protons, right? That's the way the paper um, sort of leaves things, right? Because Harman, um, because... Sturgeon thinks that um, Harmon thinks that moral facts don't figure in the best explanation of anything and wouldn't figure in the best explanation of anything, even if there were any. Sturgeon assumes that there are some for the sake of argument and says, you know, now maybe Harmon thinks that um, I know that Harmon thinks that moral facts don't explain anything, but um, that's just like thinking that the 
scientist observation, there goes a proton, is not explained by um, the existence of, proton. You, of a proton. You could believe that and be a skeptic about protons, but you've got just as much reason for being an anti-realist, uh, being a skeptic about protons as you do anti-realist about morality. And the way I diagnosed it in the paper, Moral Explanation of the Moral Beliefs, is that they're basically, Sturgeon is leaving out a possibility. He's imagining that there are these two possibilities. Moral facts exist and do explain, stuff like Hitler doing what he did, or they exist and they don't explain. Hitler didn't, did what he did, even though he wasn't a bad person. That makes us imagine that Hitler was an okay person, right? Why is Sturgeon not considering the possibility that Hitler was neither a bad person nor an okay person? Because the beginning of his paper, for the sake of argument, assumed that there were moral facts. I don't know if I, it might take longer to explain this and I've just explained it, but um, the idea is that Harman says, I don't think Hitler's badness explains why he did what he did. I think he would have done what he did even if he hadn't been a bad person. And Sturgeon says, really? Do you think, well, I guess that's true in a sense. This, the scientist would have observed the vapor trail in the cloud chamber and said, there goes a proton, even if there hadn't been a proton there, if she had been a brain in a vat, for example. Right? But that's just, but entertaining hypotheses like that is just entertaining global skepticism. And if you're going to be a skeptic about morality, you ought to be a skeptic about protons as well. And I'm saying, wait a second, to say that the moral explanation, that the explanation for why Hitler did what he did is not that Hitler was a bad person, is not to assume that Hitler was an okay person. That would really be implausible. It's to assume that Hitler, um, that there are no bad people, right? So overlooking the difference between there being no moral fact and the moral fact being that everything is permitted is really, really important. And I think it's actually the key to understanding what's wrong, um, how the anti-realist can escape from Sturgeon's argument. Maybe we'd have to talk about it longer to get it perfectly clear, but um, that's, the, that's just the rough idea there. Now you had a question about another, about another move here. The, this is what students, they, they may not think that's what they're doing, but it is what they're doing, right? what to make of that mind reading kind of move. So per, what's the evidence that students that the students are actually realists when they say that they're anti-realist? Well, they care about moral issues, but so do you and I, not realists, right? They reason about moral issues, but so do you and I, right? So um, the claim that they act as though, that students reveal that they are actually realists, whether they believe, they know what that they are or not, presupposes that that sort of behavior is evidence that you are committed to realism. But since anti-realists engage in that very sort of behavior themselves, I don't see how it can be evidence for that. Yeah, I, I just find it puzzling. I don't know why someone would think that if I make a moral judgment, it must be, or at least is a strong indication that I'm on some implicit level a realist because I, I'm not taking myself to be reporting these objective facts. Why it's would I, I why do I have to do that? It's tied in with all sorts of assumptions that you would not share. For example, that if you care, um, that it wouldn't make sense to care about it if it weren't really wrong, you know, about a, a wrong, if it weren't a real wrong, right? So you see somebody getting beaten up or raped and you try to intervene because you're outraged about this, but your outrage doesn't make any sense unless it's really wrong. So you must think it's really wrong, right? That's an assumption that you don't share. And there are many of those at play here. So people try to read you as doing that because they think in a sense that your behavior wouldn't make sense. I mean, I think that's at least part of it. But also because they want to defend, you know, moral realism. And, and it, it just seems like a profound failure of imagination. Like they can't fathom that I just don't think the way that they do. I mean, so this, I guess, so this this also comes full circle. I want to mention a couple things um, that I, I will use the gastronomic realism parody in this context as well, where I'll say, look, if I go around saying, oh, that food was delicious, or oh, that was disgusting, is that an indication that I'm a gastronomic realist? I mean, oh, look, I'm expressing normative and evaluative attitudes. Why doesn't that indicate that I'm a gastronomic realist? Do you think that there's any traction in that? Um, it's actually quite interesting you mentioned that. I made a note because I've got to think about something there. Um, I. I my initial thought is that when you say that's disgusting, it's not plausible to read you as making a factual assertion there, right? Because I don't think most people think that food, some foods are really disgusting. I could be wrong about that. But my initial thought is that 
that's not very good evidence that you actually believe that it has a certain property. Um, but I don't know. Um, we talk that way and um, a lot of people think that our talking that way is good about morality is good evidence that we're moral realists. So um, we don't want to be unfair to gastronomic realism here either. But my guess is that lots of people think that um, when I talk to students about it, they, they're, they're pretty convinced that gastronomic realism is kind of silly about a lot of stuff. The gastronomic case is a, is a difficult case. You know, there are harder cases in between, I think, like music, right? Um, music seems like something, the, the evaluative, our evaluative reactions to music seem utterly subjective. They seem like they, they're not based in, in real properties the music has. And yet, if somebody wants to tell me that, you know, that's as good as the last Brandenburg concerto, I'm, you know, music wise, um, it's just a matter of, of taste or something like that. I'm going to find that really very implausible, right? Um, but maybe that's just because some of those evaluations are just so more wide, so much more widespread and um, deeply held on some people's part, you know, because the way we're put together, you know, we will never like that first sound, but we'll like the Brandenburg sound. I don't know. Um, anyway. Okay. Uh, I, so this is my last question. Uh, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. Um, I guess one of the things that ties a lot of this together is that, you know, both of us, I think, are really, really focused on this dispute between realists and anti-realists. And for me, a lot of my concerns, and you, you already know this about me, is that I focus on what I perceive to be, um, I guess you could say a kind of rhetoric or a framing of the discourse that I find to be, uh, it, it sort of biases people against anti-realism and in favor of realism, I think by giving the misleading impression that anti-realists are like unable to object to moral wrongs, that they are, uh, they if they are motivated to care about things morally, then this is somehow a problem for them. Uh, one of the things I wonder though is like is why things are framed in that way. And this is of course assuming I'm correct in my my critical characterization of this is there's being this large rhetorical component to the way realists frame things. Like, I guess I wonder if you have any thoughts on what's motivating realists, um, because I often perceive a kind of a, like a negative attitude towards realists, or sorry, towards anti-realists, yes. like that we're bad people, that we're up to something malicious. And it's not just like we are defending a rival view about a theory of time or quantum mechanics, where it's, oh, okay, you're on the other side of this interesting intellectual dispute. Some we're, people... I, I, some people publicly state just that, right? You remember me talking about how I once heard a philosophy paper that suggested that the, the point of which was that anti-realists are either um, jerks or idiots. If they take their anti-realism seriously, why not just go around um, screwing people over all the time since there's nothing wrong with it morally? Um, and if you don't do that, you're just an idiot because you could. So why not? What's stopping you? Um, just an obscene misinterpretation of our views um, of the anti-realist perspective here. I do think psychologically, I mean, look, people are allowed to have philosophical positions because stuff looks plausible to them. That's what I do, it's what I, I assume it's what my colleagues do. Do I suspect, I think a lot of anti-realists suspect that a lot of the popularity of moral realism comes from, um, is related to the kind of emotional discomfort that comes with abandoning it um, the fear that without moral facts, everything falls apart, that if that got out, everything would fall apart, stuff like that. Um, or the idea that this person was suggesting that the only reason, the only thing holding people back from bad behavior is the belief in moral facts somehow, which is hard for me to actually imagine. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of Christians that say if they lost their belief in God, they would go out murdering and stealing and killing. And I it's just, why? Why would you do that? I don't I do not do those things because I don't want to. Same thing with the moral facts. Yeah. I mean, when people say that, that doesn't mean that people would actually do that. Or that's sure. Right. That's another case where people might not know what they actually think about that stuff. Yeah. I do wonder, though, like do, if moral realists think their behavior would change much if they became an anti-realist. I don't think that it would. Um, but I, th I suspect some of them think that um, minority has or that ours has that, you know, you can't trust an anti-realist. I, I don't know. <laughs> so some people should well, say no on a, a realist book. 
you can't trust an atheist because they don't uh, they can't swear oaths. But people who can, but people who pretend not to be atheists by swearing oaths, false oath, can be trusted. I guess I don't know. I don't know. Uh, let's let's wrap it up there. But uh, I want to uh, ask if you have any final remarks, comments, anything you want to say, and then we could wrap it up there. Um, nope. Uh, but I guess the only thing I want to say is I hope we get a chance to talk again soon. I'm happy to talk to you online anytime you want. I don't care if it's formal or informal. Um, if it's more informal or less sort of, um, if it's just kind of stream of consciousness between us, I might have less prepared answers like I did as I did today, but um, that's totally fine with me. And um, I hope we get around to collaborating on some of that work on uh, uh, the moral objectivity stuff and how it, uh, what it might tell us about metaethics. Awesome. All right. So so thanks, everybody. Uh, thanks to the viewers. Uh, please like and subscribe the video. Uh, and uh, all right, I will see everybody later.